Good morning. It's Friday, October the 16th, and this is The Drill. Thank you, thank you. The uh, prayer of the day comes from dailyscripture.net. Lord Jesus, may the light of your word free my heart from the deception of sin and consume me with a burning love for your truth and righteousness. Amen. Remember that we have free will and that we are moral agents. Only one agenda item for today, and that uh, item is part two of an article from American Conservative Magazine titled Counterfeiting uh, Conservatism. So, But I'm going to start from uh, part one from uh, yesterday and then continue on to part two. And uh, so that's Counterfeiting Conservatism Amer- from the American Conservative Magazine written by Patrick Deneen. Conservatism is the ism that came into being to resist the existence of isms. This makes for a potentially insurmountable challenge. How to invince a political belief that avoids the rigidity of ideology? Can one take a political position without becoming a political program? Can the principle stand against a politics based upon the application of universalized principle avoid itself becoming universalized? From the first moment that conservatism was articulated as a philosophy, A philosophy of tradition was born, distinct from the unconscious practices that make up any given tradition. Conservatism was thus defined by its opposition to a radical adversary. The dangers of various ideologies to traditional practice forced conservatism to articulate itself in ways that were distinctly unconservative. Ironically, every time conservatism scored a point intellectually or politically, It lost ground, since its very articulation depended on terms set by its opponent. Given that which is called conservatism originated in ways that can cut against the conservative temperament, over time it's hardly surprising that conservatism has begun to resemble reactionism. Reactionary positions not only in tactics, but in content. Because reactionism defines itself relative to the current position of its more liberal opponent, it has come to occupy space that has been abandoned by leftward-moving opposition. This is particularly true in contemporary American politics, where conservatism has not only crystallized into an orthodoxy, but into a political movement that employs scorched-earth political tactics in defense of ends and policies that stand uh, to react. Increasingly, political conservatism has allied itself with national and even international objectives destructive to conservatism. Reactionaries increasingly demand support for the expansion of military and economic power, resource exploitation with little discussion of impact upon future generations, a globalized market, a standardization of law that is increasingly unreasonable, democratization abroad, federal rather than local allegiances, mobility, and a loose affiliation with corporations and the financial world. In diagnosing the transformation of contemporary American conservatism in uh, an increasingly monolithic and even ideological movement, I would point to two developments. First, changes in electoral politics, particularly the primary system, have rewarded ideological purity over prudential reasoning and due regard for the uh, particular. Second, in response to increasingly nationalized and radicalized forms of liberalism, conservatism has tended over time to occupy the space abandoned by the leftward trajectory. While more conservative than its liberal counterpart, conservatism has thus become more ideologically liberal. The direct primary was an innovation of the progressive movement during the 20th century, aimed at removing the power of the nomination from party bosses huddled in smoke-filled back rooms, it was hoped that the direct primary would open the process to the people. Progressives of both parties, whether Democrats such as Woodrow Wilson or Republicans such as Theodore Roosevelt, supported the idea. But in a prescient article entitled The Direct Primary, 
Princeton political scientist Henry Jones Ford warned that direct primary might take power out of the hands of party chiefs, but it would not result in people's democracy. Instead, he warned, the power would flow to other places that would systematically benefit from the new arrangements. In particular, he foresaw the replacement of party operatives who had historically chosen candidates on the grounds of local circumstances, experience, and party loyalty with a plutocracy of moneyed interests that would increasingly be needed to finance expensive primary races. His intimates, uh, he int- uh, He intimates why ideology would begin to replace broadly political considerations in the nominating and subsequent governing process. Elections are increasingly financed by advocacy groups with national agendas. In many cases, the lion's share of funding for races comes from out-of-state or out-of-district sources. The plutocracy about which Ford warned tend to reward candidates of ideological purity as they most uh, neatly reflect a set of nationally defined partisan priorities. Their influence has been magnified by the low voter turnout in primary elections and the fact that highly motivated ideological or single-issue voters are the ones that turn out. In the case of conservatives, this means that primaries have become the loci where impure candidates can be eliminated from electoral consideration. Unsurprisingly, partisan rancor in Washington has risen to fever pitch, with representatives of each party conscious that efforts to compromise or bring to bear local concerns that might put them in tension with the national agenda will result in calls for a primary challenge. Thus, the progressive reforms tended to make the American system more likely to respond to a small but vocal group of ideological activists rather than than to negotiate between the varied voices of their particular districts or states and national priorities. The party system was assaulted not only for being corrupt, but more uh, fundamentally for being an obstacle to the creation of a national political system. The direct primary led to the nationalization of politics and thereby the rise of ideology as a major factor in electoral politics. It's easy to forget that it was a progressive ambition to orient the devotion of the American public to the nation and away from their localities. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 by Francis Bellamy, a Christian socialist, cousin of socialist utopian Edward Bellamy. Such advocates of nationalism saw particular and mediating allegiances as a danger to liberal democracy and instead advanced efforts to instill fealty to the nation. Thus, American history increasingly became focused on learning about the Declaration and the Constitution rather than particular people of achievement, such as Paul Revere, Betsy Ross, and Nathan Hale, people with strong local affiliations to boot. Nationalism was understood to be a necessary step in liberating individuals from local cultures that put limits upon the full expression of a more universal self-understanding, as well as the goals of personal autonomy and upward mobility. Thinkers such as Herbert Crowley and John Dewey, writing for the appropriately titled New Republic, called for a new religiously tinged devotion to the nation as the source of individual liberation and national greatness. President McKinley led the country on an imperialistic course, one later approved by progressives. Conservatives tended to defend the particularities of their states, defended the idea of a modest republic base in a self-sufficient family farming or small-scale ownership of business, and were deeply wary of the nationalizing and imperialistic proclivities of the elite coastal classes. Conservatism, even if imperfectly, was less a program than a disposition and, uh, and set of varied local practices that eschewed a monolithic and ideological orientation. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Who is the socialist? He is the man that seeks consensus rather than develop his own opinions. He is subjective, petty, and small, taking everything in life personally. He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He pretends to be your friend. He's sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. 
He's informal and terminally unique. He is childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He's pragmatic, has no conscience, and pretends that he might makes right and that the ends justify the means. He acts randomly and rationalizes his behavior, deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes, skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model, a bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you should be friends with a socialist, think again. Coming up on the next episode is part three of counterfeiting conservatism. And that concludes another episode of The Drill. Be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and always ask yourself, what is real? How do I know? And what should I do about it? I'm Ron, and that's The Drill.